while we need decentralization as a necessary condition, if not sufficient condition for anarchy, we really need to be aware that decentralization into retreat, isolation, tiny little fiefdoms, tiny little prisons is not the same thing as decentralization into a responsive, global, fluid, connective market, trade, community, collaboration, etc. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 31st episode of the show. Today we'll be speaking with someone who identifies most with Voltaire Declares still bread for the hungry style of market anarchism. Having participated in a video interview with us back in 2016, and even appearing as a headlining speaker at one of our in-person events in 2018, our guest today is no stranger to non-Servium media. Introduced to the ideas of anarchy at age 5, and organizing by age 13, our guest today has gone on to become a prolific writer and highly influential political theorist who, whether you agree with them or not, has undoubtedly made a mark in anarchist history. Here's my interview with William Gillis. William Gillis is a second generation anarchist, lapsed physicist, and transhumanist who is interested in exploring the roots of things and expanding degrees of freedom. Will is the former lead coordinator at C4SS, whose writings can be found at c4ss.org and humaniterations.net. William Gillis, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joel. Nice to be here. You might have noticed I, I did like no small talk in this because the challenge with figuring out questions for you was what not to ask. <laughs> so I think I have what I actually want to talk about. But yeah, sorry for the lack of niceties, I suppose. Okay, it's hardly controversial to point out that some proposals made by anarchists for post-state coordination fall short of an anarchy worth having. A few souls go so far as to defend centralization as a compatible and desirable component of their imagined utopias. What's a meaningful way to distinguish between centralization and decentralization? Well, I'm not certain that there's a single trick, especially one that can be put into English shortly. In some sense, decentralization is a concept that's a very visual relational concept. You either recognize it or you don't. Kind of like the best way to distinguish the color green is just to point at it, right? And especially over a podcast or an audio recording, it's hard for me to be like, okay, so look at this network structure, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course. Right. Like describe what a circle is to listeners, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I think that there's an additional component that I also want to really make clear around this language, which is the distinction between distributed and decentralized because I think some listeners will immediately latch onto that or have particular perspectives that center that distinction very hard. And so you might say that a network has no clear single center, but has many centers, right? So locally, there could be something to point to as a center. So there's a little cluster over here, there's a little cluster over there, that kind of thing. Or there's like, there's no clear president, but there are popular kids, right? Or that kind of thing. And maybe each of them have their own little click or something like that. And so we could talk about that as being a decentralized system. And some people would distinguish that from being a fully distributed system. I think as anarchists, we tend to assume that decentralized means distributed, because what we want is a distributed system. And so while there's some degrees of toleration of less than perfect distribution, because perfect distribution is almost never actually achieved in any network system and sometimes there are like practical reasons why you can't get to precisely that or shouldn't get to precisely that 
we do tend to have distributed systems in our mind when we talk about decentralization. So in terms of like distinguishing between two of them, or between centralization and decentralization, I also think that it's important to note that centralization is a generic property of structures, network, and it's applicable to information flows and a variety of different things beyond authority, political power, reputation, prestige, popularity, that kind of thing. And oftentimes anarchists will fall into the mistake of being technically pro-decentralization, but not pro anything remotely close to distribution, or they will be pro-decentralization of formal political power, but not decentralization of like decision-making or a variety of other things, right? And think that somehow those are distinguishable. And in some cases, to some degrees, those are distinguishable, but there is a sense in which like centralization of any form if you have like centralization in reputation, right, but you don't have centralization in political power, you're going to get political power centralization is going to be a knockoff effect. It's, it's likely to emerge as a consequence of that centralization in that other form. Similarly, if you have centralization in information flow, in you know, we all go before the collective and make decisions before the collective that can create spaces for power in various ways that don't line up with anarchist ideals or that could ultimately compound into the reformation of political and clear authoritarian centralization. So what are the benefits of decentralization and distributed networks then? And how might it complement or conflict with the market process? The last one's an interesting question. So decentralization can open up the possibility of greater efficiency and resiliency in a variety of contexts that centralized systems can't. It can also create inefficiencies for certain ends. So it's important to talk about the distinction between some ends or some projects and some contexts are more easily accomplishable through decentralized approaches and others are more easily accomplished through centralized approaches. And also, obviously, there's a vast variety of things that can be put under the umbrella of a centralized approach or a decentralized approach. So you could conceive of a situation where somebody has a centralized mean of solving a problem that is radically different and inferior to a different centralized means, right? And somebody could have a decentralized means of solving a problem that is radically different and inferior to a different decentralized means of solving a problem. And I think that gets a little bit towards the market thing. One of the examples I love to give is round robin meetings where politically everyone is perfectly equal. There's no centralization of final say or that kind of thing. Because everyone has to shut their mouth and listen while a single person presents, that's kind of a centralized information flow as a consequence. It can be less efficient in getting everyone through the relevant exchanges of information that need to be made. So like if there's a bunch of arguments between individuals going on, there's no need to have everyone else pause what they're doing to listen. So you have 150 people inside of this giant spokes council meeting or whatever, like all having to be silent while one person talks at a time and handles an argument between individuals that maybe they don't actually care about or particulars that they don't particularly care about. So maybe the people who do care about that given thing just go off and argue about it on their own instead of holding up everyone else who can't you know, think their own thoughts, go into other subjects they're interested in while those people have the floor. So that's a sense of like information flow centralization. And so that's an inefficiency that's present in some systems that are decentralized in some, of some ways. As to the and I could go in a lot of directions on this, but I think the, the one that I really want to go off of is you were talking about how decentralization can conflict with markets. And I think that's an interesting question, and I do want to drill into that. So the way that left market anarchists tend to define markets, we tend to make them almost synonymous with economic decentralization, and we tend to make capitalism synonymous with economic centralization. Now, there's some additional components to the definition, so reveal preference through trade, that kind of thing, are also necessary. But there's a few ways that you could actually say that markets don't take decentralization far enough. So like markets tend to be, they tend to involve a high degree of mutual connectivity. And there's a sense in which this could be portrayed as creating centralization of prices. So like if there is a common currency that emerges, that can be read as a centralization. And I mean, similarly, you could say that really sort of any commonality between people like a shared language or, you know, honestly, even the internet can be described as centralized because it involves common protocols that all the computers speak to one another. So in some like made a sense, this is centralization within the space of ideas or possible languages, right? Computers could choose conceivably alternative protocols to talk to one another, but there's become sort of one hegemonic or a few hegemonic protocols that are used to like communicate between one another in various layers on the stack. 
And so that, in some sense, can be read as centralization by some people. Similarly, some folks use a generalization of the concept of decentralization to argue against consciousness itself, because consciousness involves the integration of various sub-processes in your brain. So people can and do apply decentralization to argue against any notion of truth or science or anything along those lines, because they see mutual convergence on any singular position or opinion or behavior as centralization. Obviously, I don't think that's particularly uh, useful or reflects the freedom and agency and the motivations that anarchists have for embracing decentralization in another variety of contexts. And I think one of the great things about the market or market systems and market approaches is that they allow for emergent commonalities, right? Emergent consensus in a variety of ways. But you could see that emergence of something near equilibrium state, market clearing, convergence upon like one price, that kind of thing in a variety of situations as being itself a kind of centralization. And I think that's about as much as I would say on that. There are degrees, of course, within the market that I think maybe this is the direction that you were trying to go, that there are degrees within the market that they're like centralizing or like feedbacking accumulative tendencies that could conceivably generate out into like capitalism again and vast monopolies and kind of centralization. Obviously, there are a variety of structures, and maybe we can get into those, or dynamics within markets and different cultures and that kind of thing that prevent or push back very strongly to varying degrees and varying contexts upon those kinds of accumulative tendencies and centralization tendencies. And there are things that people will call like natural monopolies or things that people will say are more, to put it more in, in the language that I would use, more or less prone to runaway accumulation and centralization. and. I think the goal of anarchists is to, the market isn't this magical entity that sits outside of us. The market is the sum of human relations in a certain space of like trade and that kind of thing. And we have, there's immense amount of variables and things that we ourselves can do to push back upon that kind of centralization. But yeah, I think it is important not to hold up decentralization and centralization as like the central axis or definition of anarchism. Obviously, anarchists require decentralization in a variety of different forms, and those are necessary, if not sufficient conditions for a freer society. But it's important not to overly belabor the concept of centralization or decentralization, because I have seen in many cases people rapidly take it in directions that are like utterly ludicrous, or that don't reflect the motivations we had for adopting that kind of analysis. So there are obviously a lot of anarchist proposals for how we might coordinate in a post-state society. One of the critiques you have of systems that are not market-oriented and kind of focus more on, say, community assemblies and neighborhood assemblies and things like that, your critique often relates to social capital. But you might be able to use that same critique to some extent towards markets also. So how might the problem of social capital affect a regional anarchist confederation versus a democratically ran workers cooperative in a competitive marketplace? Well, not to, not to get too fixated in on the specific terms that you used, but I think the term regional anarchist confederation is both specific and very wide and open and perhaps too specific to address a variety of different communist anarchist conceptions, collectivist anarchist conceptions, etc., of their ideal world, and is also so wide that it's hard to speak to like the exact mechanisms that would happen there. I think a lot of non-market anarchists who speak of things like confederation have a lot of extremely varied ideas as to what that would look like, or maybe to be less charitable they have a fuzzy intuition in mind. And then if you press them on the details or assume anything in any way enough to make a critique, they feel like that's really unfair. And I want to be clear that, yeah, as you say, like, you know, social capital dynamics can have negative impacts in the market as well. There's like another sense outside of the, the workers cooperative example that you gave, in which we can talk about more individualistic dynamics in which social capital has a huge impact. So to give a broader example, if we just had like a world of free floating individual artisans contracting with one another as need be to build things or to, you know, collaborate in whatever way, and there wasn't anything like the centralization of like a cooperative, right? Or any sort of thing like a cooperative or a group like that, there would still be the problem of social capital in a broader sense and social capital dynamics that are feedbacking or that provide centralization. So one of the things that often have emerges in networks is power law kind of distributions where by default the network slides into a tendency where 
there's kind of an exponential uh, or deeply unequal distribution of degrees of connectivity within the network. So one example of this happening in a very, very individualistic sort of market or world or scene is like the hacker world. And one thing that you'll often see happen is that when somebody makes a name for themselves as like a, a computer security expert, that often means that not only do more people follow them and pay attention to them, but more people give them tips. More people try to loop them into collaborations. More people loop them into conversations and things along those lines. And that means that they have a higher degree of connectivity, which means that they can profit from that higher degree of connectivity in a variety of ways. So one way would be that if you have a lot of independent individual actors randomly that have like spark of brilliance or spark of insight, and they start spreading that around, the person who is closer to the center and even in a polycentric, highly distributed, but still has certain highly connected nodes, those more connected individuals will be more likely to pick up and be able to exploit or take or make use of those insights maybe combine them with something else that the individual doesn't have access to, if the insightful individual doesn't have immediate access to themselves. And so that's a sense in which celebrity dynamics, that kind of thing can compound and create real social or like uh, real capital differentiations. If you have people whose entire job is to serve as gatekeepers to information, right? Or as as kind of in the arbitrage position of relaying information from one set to another set, those people can oftentimes benefit from runaway connectivity effects, and the incentives that they the incentives that they face or the incentives they have are oftentimes not pro-social. So somebody becomes like the speaker for you know a certain subsect of science, right, and becomes like the the science reporter on it. And that person can then influence or control or create like a small little like fiefdom or, you know, whatever over how that information gets sent off, what information gets sent off to the brighter public and can kind of shut off or push out competitors against against them. Similarly, there's dynamics around reporting and journalists of like activist movements, that kind of thing. So you might see reporters slide into a certain position where suddenly they are the spokesman of like a movement on the ground and have immense power, prestige, money, fortune, connection, book deals, that kind of thing as a consequence of that. And, you know, there's a lot of incentives there for them to keep that position. And oftentimes when they have that kind of social capital or that kind of respect, they can leverage that in a variety of ways to keep that. Now, that dynamic is universal and applies across um, any sort of situation where there's reputation networks. So it applies both in market situations and it applies in non-market situations. It is particularly pernicious in non-market situations because at least in a market situation, you can always choose to just be like, fuck this, I made a thing, do you want to trade with me or not, right? Whereas outside of a market situation where you have a collective meeting and you have individuals going before the collective to make decisions collectively, all those decisions are happening through social interactions. There's a kind of two poles here. One direction is like a bureaucratic direction, so that these decisions are happening in a hyper bureaucratic way. And the other direction is that things are happening in a much more personable social way. But either way, if you don't excel at like, you know, micromanaging rubber tools of order or like whatever the bureaucratic consensus process is or whatever, you maybe get shut out of resources that matter to some significant degree, or you get shut out of power influence, etc. If you have social capital in that situation, you can leverage that social capital because who is going to stand up to the person before the consensus meeting or who's going to stand up instead of a variety of situations? What is the consequence of you calling out this person if the decision of the collective determines whether or not you eat, right? <laughs> or like those kinds of things. Whereas like at least with a market, there's a certain degree of resiliency in terms of distribution because everything isn't focused into like single collective decision making processes where individuals can act more as individuals. Now, you brought up the example of like cooperatives. A cooperative can clearly fall into the same collective decision making traps as a commune, a discrete, you know, a singular collective commune, right? But I want to be fair here that like a lot of anarcho communists and others do not necessarily conceive of 
their ideal world as being one of like a discrete commune or like the regional commune or like you know we each re- organize in the collectives and maybe these collectives have some like overlap but then regionally all those collectives go before the spokes council and make a collective decision as all those collectives collectively right like not everyone has that frame as their default frame and i think that frame is obviously unanarchistic has obvious problems with it but you know i feel like it's it is extremely uncharitable to claim that anarcho communists as a whole have that as their uh, inclination i think most anarcho communists at least those that have been around for a while or that came to their politics in a way that wasn't i don't know like a youtube video tend to think a little bit more nuancedly or a little bit more have a little bit more consideration into the, those structures nevertheless i still feel like you know obviously they haven't thought far enough on it they may have the intuitive or the moral understanding that you can't just have the great bureaucratic meeting that never ends or put everything before the collective and think that that's not going to be a power structure in and of itself. But I just don't think that folks tend to like think consistently out what the alternatives to that imply. So people will be like, well, decentralized person to person gift economies and then don't really like process through what that Im- amounts to because gift economies have immense social capital dynamics, at least historically existing gift economies. And then there are various problems with the proposal, proposed gift economies that are more just like Christmas every day um, <laughs> that some people have historically proposed, but are obviously vastly different from the anthropological record of like what gift economies have historically been. So there's a variety of different things here. Maybe I should drill in a little bit more to the notion of why a bunch of collectives and then a collective of collectives is like a terrible fucking idea. So... One, there's the issue of representation. So if collectives have to like make decisions and a confederation is a collective of collectives, then they are going to have to have some sort of representation, right? Like we as the collective made this decision, this individual or this like piece of paper or whatever goes before the broader collective and tells you what our decision as a collective is. But then how do you wait? Like, you know, are you using perfect consensus within the group? You know, are you using perfect consensus at the lower levels and at the top level? Are you using democracy in the majoritarian sense, which is, I I mean, I I feel like that's so obviously a power dynamic. You know, majority rules is not the same thing as no rulers. You know, I, I feel like I could do a whole session here explaining why, like, some kids who found a YouTube channel that was like, what if we did exactly what your civics textbook says the U.S. government is, but we just called it anarchy? are like wrong and how that's not fucking anarchism right but like i don't really know that that's particularly useful in this context and i feel like probably most of our uh, most of the listeners of this would already kind of understand those critiques but they can point them towards my critique of democracy the broader anarchist critiques of democracy the symposium that we've had etc that kind of thing uh, and also i should say that i've talked about consensus too but even in consensus there's all sorts of different like power dynamics and things that can creep in couple examples or something if you're using consensus you're cramming a lot of decisions into like a kind of a centralized communications log jam between everyone and consensus is never like a perfect consensus so there's pressures that have to be negotiated back and forth somebody has to basically be like oh well you know i'll tolerate a little bit of something that i don't like in order for some you know in order to get something that i do like or better than the alternative etc but it's oftentimes very hard to do intersubjective comparisons of disutility or preference or desire or that kind of thing in that environment. And so oftentimes those who communicate better, those who present their ideas more passionately, who leverage certain cards, like superficial card playing, that kind of thing, can simply get more say or get the consensus skewed a little bit more towards their direction. So there's proportionality in terms of like when there's like some sort of gradient between one position versus another position and some sort of consensus has to be reached in the middle. Oftentimes power, social capital, charisma, neurotypicality in different ways. These things play different roles in terms of that. And then there's all sorts of centralization just in the very fact that there's centralization of the, of the discussion. Right? So like who controls what proposals go before consensus and how they get formulated? What counts as the default decision if consensus isn't reached? Let's say that there's several similar proposals where independently people have like spitballed and then somebody, you know, who's doing facilitation is like, oh, yeah, well, let's merge those like proposals into one because you're all basically saying the same thing. Well, maybe they're not all saying exactly the same thing. And maybe also when you choose the language, 
these very specific little tiny details that you're like smuggling in, right? And then like consensus will become oriented around this like Schnelling point or this kind of like starting assumption or any number of ways which deeply shapes the path contingent negotiation processes that spiral out from that. Okay. So there's some proposed models that are in between bureaucratic centralization and completely freed markets, right? There's, there's of course, hybrid economic models that mix a kind of decentralization while maintaining aspects of what we might consider economic planning. Participatory economics, also known as PearCon, comes to mind. What are the promises and the problems with these sorts of systems? Well, systems as a whole, there's so many that it's hard for me to necessarily talk to them. But uh, Paracon, uh, that is an interesting one to bring up. Paracon, it's just the bureaucratization of everyday life. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't really think that there's anyone of any real number in the anarchist scene as a whole that has ever really taken Paracon seriously. It's kind of fun because it's a self-evident nightmare. I mean, you can find like anarchist responses to it from across the like the spectrum of possible anarchist positions. I'm talking well within like anarcho-communism, anarchist syndicalism, anarcho-collectivism, whatever, that like came out the moment that Michael Albert made his initial proposals. And these critiques are just like a complete knockout, right? Like they're brutal. And it's kind of the reason why like Paracon never really took off. And particularly the like you want to turn everything into endless fucking meetings and bureaucratization, Paracon was like, well, uh, not, not, uh, <laughs> not really. Right. Like it, there was no response really. And it was, it was, it was just a complete fucking knockout. And th that's the reason why, like, you know, as always, like, you know, leftists are great when they're like, here are all the problems with the current existing economic system. And you're like, mm. yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me about it. I love it. Great. A hundred percent. I'm with you. And then they're like, and so what we're going to do is not do those. And you're like, I don't, that's not that's not a proposal. And then they start talking in like particulars and you're like, Oh God, no! what, <laughs> what are you even, what? No, that's not, you've just made the problem worse. So <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. Okay. So like I've been in endless activist meetings for over two decades, right? Including God, 14 hour meetings that began before the sun rose and finished long after the sun fucking set. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like almost no activist thinks that meetings are like a good thing, much less prefigurative than if anything that we'd like to see, especially that kind of meeting or that kind of collective decision-making negotiations. They are an excruciating chore that we are forced into by various circumstances. The whole point of going to meetings, as more than a few people I've known in a variety of different cities have independently said on their own, the whole point of going to meetings is so that we'll never have to go to meetings again, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> the war to end all wars? Right. Well, well, in some <laughs> sense, like the consensus meeting is, I think, or the consensus actives meeting for many anarchists is, I think, in many ways, like our version or one of our aspects of like the Lenin estate, right? We do this in order to not do it, right? <laughs> like, the, idea, the, the idea is that this is decidedly not prefigurative of the world that we would like to see. And so we are forced into it because of a variety of vagaries and particulars of, you know, the existence that we're within. But it has never been a goal in and of itself. There, there are some individuals who actually love meetings. <sighs> they are sad and weird creatures, but the vast majority of activists who have any real experience with them, like, understand the severe limitations and the downsides. And, you know, like, if that's your vision of a better world, where we have meetings to talk about the meeting and then push this over there, and, like, it's all push and pull and bureaucratic back and forth by, like, you know, concentric levels and all these sorts of, like, endless discussions. If that's your vision of a better world, you aren't going to drag many of us along with you. In fact, I, you know, I'm going to be one of the people throwing Molotovs at, like, your fucking meeting. Like, you know, <laughs> it's bullshit. And I don't think any of us, you know, charitably, a lot of the people who I find online who get dragged to this kind of stuff have no real experience in the streets organizing, like in any significant degree, right? They haven't had to organize any real large projects or things over an extended period of time. They haven't had like a diversity of experiences if they've had any real experiences. And they they tend to much like the folks who watch like a YouTube video and then think that like anarchy equals like basically a civics class 101 of, of the US government, um, just with the names and the flags changed. They tend to have a lack of experiential like contact with alternatives.
And so like, you know, I, I don't tend to begrudge these folks too much because I'm like, look, just seven years from now, get back to me and fucking go off to me again about how meetings are the best thing ever and how they resolve everything and how there's no problems with them or no, no severe catastrophic both psychological and, you know, sociological and just information processing problems with them, power, all these, all these different things. You either have, you either have that empirical experience and familiarity with the avenues of abuse. And there's just so many, right? Like either you are like socially aware enough, have enough emotional intelligence to be able to process or broader analytic awareness to be able to like be in a situation where there's a bunch of competing dynamics, power dynamics going on in a meeting understand how those play out, watch them play out, and then see like the the various failure modes, the vast array of failing modes that are possible, or you like have not really had that experience, right? Or like are just blind in so some ways to those dynamics. And I can't really like convey the vast diversity of all the different failure modes because what will start happening is you start, you know, like there's like it's just it's infinite, right? It's fractal in terms of the failure modes. You start listing them and then people who have never been to a meeting before are like, well, but what if we have a meeting to stop that? And you're like, what? <laughs> and like, they want to like narrow in on hyper particular details of like individual problems. And you're like, no, but these are like endemic. They arise from the centralization. They arise from all these other different aspects of it. And they just don't, they don't grasp that. I think you just need to have some like hands on thing, much the same way that like, you know, on an audio podcast, I can't explain to you really what a circle is. You have to look at a fucking circle mm -hmm. to grasp what a circle is, much the same way you have to like sit through meetings, you have to have engagement, you have to have long term organizing experience, or like, you know, you can have short term if you're particularly like intuitive about it, but like you have to you have to have some tangible level of experience to be able to grasp these things. I do think that the Paracon folks deserve honest praise for trying to explicitly work things out to actually make even a somewhat detailed alternative to markets hmm. because almost no other anarchist rejecting markets has been willing to do that. That really is the thing. Like Paracon is the one example other than mutualism and various mutualist like left market anarchist schools. It's the one example of an anarchist approach that has actually been willing to like sit down and work it out. Unless you're going to count like, you know, fucking the bread book or something where fucking just sketches on the back of a napkin, some central planning. And then it's like, oh, well, like city town communes will make these decisions. And like, if people don't do work, and there's a scarcity of food, which of course, there wouldn't be. But if there is a scarcity, then just, you know, the town will vote on whether that individual gets the fat or not. Like, <laughs> <sighs> I mean, that, that's literally a component. I don't know why anarchists don't realize just the power dynamics that are baked into that, and the lack of deeper consideration that's gone into it. Paracon, actually, I think, like Michael Albert, as much as I'm like ragging on Paracon, I think that Paracon is honestly like, I, I feel more at home having a conversation with somebody who is an advocate of Paracon because they have the intellectual sincerity and the nerdiness and the rigor and the sense of obligation to go through and do the work and try to like build a model, right? Mm -hmm. And the model that they end up building is a clusterfuck. It's a self-evident reductio. It is absurd on the face of it. It is catastrophic nightmare dystopia. But, hey, that's useful, too. And I actually think that, <laughs> in many ways, Paracon does the work of market anarchists. If we, were, if we were to create Paracon, right, as and be like, well, you guys haven't done the work to flesh out what your alternative markets would be, so we'll do it for you. Here's what we think it'll look like. It'll look like Paracon. We would be fucking excoriated, right? Like, every single person on the planet would be like, that is so unfair. That is so <laughs> outrageous. No one actually believes that. You guys are full of shit. How fucking dare you? Like, and, and rightfully so. It would be unfair for <laughs> us to do that. But Paracon, like, being sincere and earnest and actually doing the work on, the, on their own, oh, God, it's so useful for us. They're like an auxiliary to our project because we can point to them and be like, well, I mean, guys, do you want that? <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, if you don't want to go to meetings, you can just maybe skip some of those. Okay, but then literally all social power and decisions that be piped in those meetings. I mean, like, I, it's just, <sighs> we're talking in such abstract terms. And like, you know, we don't have the time in a podcast to drill down on the particulars, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I mean, like, Paracon, like, explicitly appoints, they're like, okay, you'll have your fellow workers evaluate how hard you're working, and whether you're being like, earnestly like working and then what are the contingent conditions? So like you're pregnant. Well, obviously your workers have to make exceptions to the fact that you're like pregnant, blah, 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 blah. 
And I'm just like, I don't know, like I've worked in tons of workers cooperatives and shit, and I've done self-evaluation, co-worker evaluation meetings, that kind of thing. There's been a variety of situations where I've been essentially in the situations that they're describing. And, you know, there is some degree to which we can work out to some minimal level of functionality, right? But, so, sorry, I'm just trying to drill down on one detail here, which is the, the worker mutual evaluation kind of like thing. But if you don't see the ways that opens up arenas for social power, and if you don't realize that you need desperately very individualized alternatives for people to fall back on in fluid ways that aren't just like, well, I'm formally now leaving my associative workers, productive, blah, 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 right? If you don't have ways for people to just be like, okay, well, I just, I transition on the market to doing this other thing. I just, I trade to this other person instead. If you don't have like very fluid ways of individuals of exiting, if you will, or of having alternative options and a vast plethora of alternative options immediate to hand, then I don't know. It's just like Paracon seems so self-evidently a clusterfuck. Yeah, you know, obviously I've read Michael Albert's book. You know, there's this other book where somebody's like, okay, let's let's try to do like accounting and talk about like as an accountant how like accounting would work in Paracon. And it's it's a nightmare every time. <laughs> like how do you communicate back and forth from the and then like, okay, you have to quantify, but then also like how do you convey like truly evaluate intersubjective desires and intensities without like the basic reveal preference of trade, et cetera? Like it's just there's so many things wrong with it. And the best thing about Paracon is that it reveals almost intuitively and immediately to most people this is the problem. Like this does not work. This is catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Which isn't to say that there aren't like people working on projects that are not Paracon who are anti market, right? Like Matilda McCauley is working on a vast array project that she's trying to put together as far as i know she hasn't really like gone beyond the initial like most preliminary outlining of like conditions here are the conditions that this project would like to meet without even starting on the project itself but there are people who are sincerely trying to work and develop non-market decentralized anarchist systems and i wish them the best it would be great if you could get that to work without catastrophic failures i just you know uh, i don't see any remote hope in those so far so what are some examples then of decentralized efforts expanding freedom and how might they compare to some notable classical, more centralized struggles of the past, such as the CNT? Huh. Okay. Decentralized efforts expanding freedom. I mean, this is like the entirety of anarchist praxis, right? And this goes entirely beyond how would an ideal, more liberatory world be structured? What would be the structures of that more liberatory world? The means to get to freedom or to more freedom in ways that are coherent with that, that stay more anarchist. I did actually a thread on Twitter a little while ago, and I think the categories that I gave, the Sweden categories were insurrection, development, contestation, hacking, prefiguration, and erosion. These are like distinct categories in different ways. Insurrection typically gets defined by like, you know, you're trying to compound popular resistance, you're trying to build broader actions of resistance that undermine existing power structures and control systems. So derailing a train carrying armed shipments to Israel is an example. And one of the main things in the distinguishes this category from hacking is that you're trying to go for reproducible attacks. So like you burn a cop car, that is both a demonstration of what can be done and it is the perfect propaganda in some sense, right? Like a ton of people who are in oppressed communities who are in certain relations with broader power structures or society as a whole don't really need to be told that the cops are the enemy. They need to be shown that like it is possible you can get away with, you can do damage by fighting back in certain ways. And so when somebody throws a Molotov and sets a cop car on fire in like the George Floyd uprising, whatever, that can unleash kind of like copycat actions or this compounding kind of resistance. So Insurrection is broadly usually taken as one example of a decentralized, bottom-up, individualized, but also intensely social, you know, strong aspects of collaboration and mutual aid. Just not like, the, you know, the, the commune doesn't vote to go out and do an insurrection, right? Like, if a commune is voting to go do an insurrection, it's not an insurrection. An insurrection is a bottom-up, bubbling-up kind of, like, in, uh, individualistic process. Hacking, in many ways, I distinguish as distinct from insurrection, or and maybe hacking is the best form, term for the category, but it's the term that I've like, rarely started using. Hacking, I see as more context-dependent exploits. So whereas like people going out and fighting Israeli tanks or whatever, throwing a rocket in an Israeli tank in an intifada is like a reproducible form of attack, right? 
everyone can do that. Hacking is more, you found some particular situation, some particular distinct bit of awareness that you have, or some sort of structural instability or exploit. And you take advantage of that in like a one-off way. So like this is more like proactively, intellectually, you go through and you think about the world around you, the opportunities that are available to you, the complexities and the dynamics of like control systems. And so Phineas Fisher, um, the hacker who formed attacks on a uh, number of surveillance corporations, that kind of thing, is like a great example of this. I mean, there's, there's some brilliant hacking that was done in that where they like took a really long time, maybe like a year setting up an escalation from one system to another system, and then they got them all the stuff that they wanted to get. There's other things you can do. Breaking critical infrastructure at a certain point isn't the same thing as like a sustained generalized insurrection against control infrastructure. So like, Generalized insurrection would be like everybody inside of an oppressive country. Obviously, none of these examples apply to the United States. I would never encourage anything that breaks the law in the United States. <laughs> but like, say, in an oppressive country, unlike the United States, if you were out on the streets and you like, kids were off breaking surveillance cameras, CCTV cameras of like the state and like the UK or whatever. It's great that I can advocate breaking CCTV cameras in the UK, but I can't do it in the US. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so if, if a bunch of kids are off like breaking CCTV cameras in, in the UK, that's very much like an insurrectionary kind of approach. But if somebody like finds a fucking like code exploit that allows them to like crash the entire shot spotter system or like, you know, the centralized infrastructure that like integrates all that and saves the information from those CCTV cameras, that's more like a hacking mode. So hacking is also a deeply individualistic kind of like structure. I mean, there are strong levels of collaboration and social affinity and that kind of thing that come with it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is an individual in some sense, you know, having an insight, whether those individuals are having a couple of insights in collaboration and then collaborating together with those insights. That insight is the individuals like thinking forwardly, figuring out through like a maze, figuring out the path through the maze, right? And the other modes of resistance or ways to get to a better world. So there's like, there's erosion. So erosion means the way that I'm using it, it means like generally making things in the world more decentralized, more competitive, more responsive, deter deterritorializing things, making responses and awarenesses and models more accurate, uh, more finely accurate. And so like, this can look like, you know, you set up a bike cooperative or you start working as like independent contractors in different ways and you break apart like an industry into, you know, obviously not like the fake independent contractor shit where it's like one Silicon Valley like behemoth tries to set up a walled garden and acts as the intermediary and control and basically have you as workers without rights. But like a situation where it's like more decentralized one on one interactions where, you know, you make kombucha, you make micro brews for your community, your friends and the micro or the localization or the decentralization of like production processes, um, for example, is like one example of erosion. And so like that broader, like maybe that moves those peoples or the, that community more and more outside of the direct lens of the state because it becomes more the kind of black market processes or gray market processes become more illegible to the state in the James Scott sense. It's harder for them to tax if everything that you're doing is in barter deeply under the table or whatever, because it's more individualized or it's more like decentralized in that way. There's a variety of other things in that category. Prefiguration is also really important. So that means developing alternative social modes. And maybe this is getting back to like the conversation we were having. But I think that I want to use this category in a broad sense and talk about both technological stack and social organizational forms or relational forms. So cultures of consent, right? Like punks building different ways of relating to one another. Maybe that even looks something like polyamory or whatever, like various different explorations of different ways of relating. That's prefigurative, right? Like we test it out and we implement it in our daily lives. And also in some sense, this is a picture of the world that we would like to build, unlike the meeting that never ends, right? Like the new ways of relating, of ferreting out domination in our everyday interactions with one another, finding new norms of relating towards one another. Those are things that are very like prefigurative. And provide us with a lot of hands-on experience so that we can iterate and like learn, oh, when we do it precisely that way, that doesn't work. If you do poly, here are some things that we've learned from experience, work better or work worse. Here are some of the ways that that can turn like toxic and provide cover for abusers. Here's some of the ways that that can counter abuse, right? That kind of thing. And then also this applies to like setting up alternative mesh infrastructures in terms of technological stack. All sorts of other different things that are more like decentralized and more organic or fluid and anarchist. So there's like two other categories that I don't think a lot of other anarchists talk about or admit that much. 
one of them is development. And I may, I kind of carve this out very distinctly from hacking because development in the sense I'm kind of talking about like invention. So technological development is, it's very like path dependent. So if you spend time working to build certain technologies, you're not going to necessarily spend a lot of time building out other technologies. So if you build out solar panels in like this one pathway, utilizing carbon and this like compound with this other thing, you're not going to learn and then open up new avenues through like another another compound or another like, you know, okay, so so like with solar panels, one of the major problems that we're facing is that, and this is replicated all over the history of technological and structural development, is that like big social changes in the sense of like if China goes out, the PRC goes out and strip mines huge regions of China to get rare earth minerals and put them on the market for cheap, the global market. And, you know, in order to do this, they have to do a variety of like intense state violent kind of things, dispossessing tons of people of their land, poisoning waterways and aquifers and things that huge numbers of people depend upon. All sorts of things that would never function in individualized like market economy because you would be responsible for that kind of thing and people would see that as aggression, right? But the state can get away with it. And so it reduces the price of certain rare earth metals, which means that if you are in a university in the West and you are going to get a grant from technology, from IBM or some whatever source to develop more efficient solar panels, you have a lot of options for like what sort of materials you can work with and what sort of materials you can investigate. And if China hadn't done that, then you would work with materials that don't have rare earth metals in them, right? Because you would be like, well, those are way too expensive. But because China has artificially deflated the prices of them through extensive state violence, it would actually make more sense for folks to skew research in the direction of the things that are cheaper. So the people who will hand out the grants, et cetera, will say, well, you know, we want you to do research in the places where we can actually make the most amount of money. It's important not to think of that as being power determines technology in this like straightforward way, right? There can oftentimes be low-hanging fruit that just don't get grants or that don't require a lot of deep investment or dig to an alternative that immediately makes a different technological pathway cheaper that jumps out ahead and is like, oh, well, this pure carbon approach that we use is actually better than this doped material that uses this rare earth metal, right? And no one investigated this because they didn't want to put the money down when they could automatically do it in this other direction. So sometimes, though, you can jump ahead just by yourself, you know, with no money, investigating and doing that kind of experimentation and investigation on your own. And sometimes you can do it with very little amount of money or startup capital investment in the broader sense of like a bunch of hippies in a fucking in a scientific commune in the middle of wherever end up working as a side project or in like a repossessed squatted village of hackers and like the you know in the mountains of Catalonia or whatever like start working on alternative pathways and realize certain possibilities that would never be funded in the current power social like technological development situation and i think that those are really important i think that some of the most important work that can be done is oftentimes done by individuals being willing to invent and develop and explore in directions that are not getting funding and not getting funding for reasons of power, for reasons of like structural dynamics along those lines, when there are good reasons to expect that there could actually be payoffs in those directions that could, you know, at least provide competitive options for those of us that don't want to get locked into technological development pathways that depend upon resources that are hugely destructive, right? There's lots of examples of this, but that's just one of them, and I'll try to move on. There's also, there's contestation. And this is probably oftentimes thought of as the least anarchist of the possibilities, but I actually think that it is part of a balanced diet, as it were, of modes of pathways to a freer world. Contestation, in my sense here, means applying pressures to shift the everyday balances of power. And so this can be, you know, you have, so there's protocols on the internet, right? There are certain standardization boards on the internet that are like, you know, eight fucking people and they decide basically which encryption technology gets used or encryption form gets used by virtually every single computer in the world, right? And in some sense, they're like expert bodies and their like goals are, you know, this is pure like the authority of the bootmaker. But in some significant sense, of course, these boards get tons of industry and nefarious CIA. NSA level like influence, right? If not direct appointees. And so oftentimes, you know, inside some of the situations, you'll have like one secret anarchist on this board who is, you know, appointed there because they're an expert in their field, right? 
And so they, they know cryptography, they know the situation. And then like, some people start being like, well, you know, it's all really great that you, you could use that curve, but like, ultimately, I think it's like basically the same thing. And actually there's some knockoff benefits of like this curve. And the person who's the anarchist is just like, I don't, I'm, that doesn't make any sense. That's actually an inferior curve in specific ways. The benefits that you're talking about are really minor in comparison. Why are you, and then realizes, oh shit, you like, you're taking money from the NSA. And the NSA is the the reason why the NSA wants everyone to adopt that you know thing is because they think that there's a backdoor they can use on it. And so if you're like an anarchist in that context, you need to push back against that, right? Like that is a policy decision that's very much like a a lot of people would write this off as like a reformism thing, right? Like this is just a matter of like you know state policy, even if the situation example that I'm giving of like a an advisory board on like a protocol or like nor setting norms and that kind of thing is purely by like reputation and there's no like legal sanction whatsoever on it. Like, clearly, this board, nevertheless, has, like, power and influence. And as an anarchist, you need to, like, leverage whatever the fuck you can to push back on that to raise bloody hell to make sure that it doesn't happen. Because, like, a lot on, like, a global scale can turn on that specific change. And this can also be, like, people, you know, rioting to try to stop SESTA-FOSTA or that kind of thing. Or, like, you know, there, there's been lots of laws that were not passed. SESTA-FOSTA, unfortunately, was passed. But there's, like, there's, there's contestation over, like, whether or not certain norms certain policies, certain laws, whether or not those things get implemented, what direction they get implemented. It's important not to get dragged forever into the electoral morass of the quagmire of the very low return on investment of electoral politics and the corruption and the incentive skews that come with it. But there are instances where you can raise bloody hell and stop like old growth forests from getting clogged, right? And that's a matter of contestation. So uh, yeah, those are the six, I think, total modes. I Sorry, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, 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 it does. Okay. So proponents of centralized schemes also come in a right-wing variety. And in a different article you wrote on nationalism, you point out how the, quote, national anarchists or neo-reactionary image of a world broken apart into patchwork of small, discrete tribes or communes is fundamentally at odds with the positive human freedom enabled by the diffused and fluid interaction of individuals. Neo-reactionaries go wrong in a lot of ways, but do you view them specifically as a special kind of threat, seeing that they seek to be the intellectual vanguard of the right? So I think that ideas do matter. And I think that the specific formulations and cultural constructions that people have matter a lot. I definitely do not agree with the Marxist notion that ideology is the secondary effect of material conditions or base. Individuals can have a huge influence, ideas can have a huge influence, and oftentimes do in like really skewed ways and can shape discourses and paradigms and all sorts of different ways. So I think that whoever is the intellectual vanguard of the right in any situation or a reactionary or whoever are the defenders of power and tradition and that kind of thing, whether we call that the right or not, that always matters, right? I think neo-reaction matters in particular, specifically because their vision of the return to negative freedom, of isolation, of relative simplicity, they reflect broader trends that are happening within reaction as a whole as we move out of the relatively weird post-World War II, Cold War era, and all of the extremely unique and not in consistency with the rest of history, kind of like dynamics that were playing out during that. So I think the right as a whole is polarizing back to, hey, you know, how do you keep power stable? Oftentimes, the best way to have stable power is to have a small little like fucking cult compound, right? Is to have like a small little commune or whatever, where you can shut off the outside world and keep your traditions and things relatively stable and you know, so your patriarchal abusive dynamics stay uh, relatively stable and without like alternatives or options of, of not just exit, but of awareness, trade, flow, integration, etc. And so I think that neo reactionaries are reflective of that. But I think that camp as a whole needs to be analyzed as a whole, or that like broader tendency as a whole needs to be analyzed as a whole. There's many, like, I think, particularities of the neo cameralist I think that the king as a CEO model that they have is not particularly that insightful, original, or likely to actually be implemented all that many places, more than it already kind of is. There's this kind of funny sense in which, I don't know if you've seen recently, but 
and this is kind of like recent development, but like Nick Land was recently screaming or like going off about how Curtis Yarovan is now basically sliding away from that language. No in way. Situations. Yeah, well, yeah. So there was some sort of thing where he was just basically talking about like the um, monarchist just notion of like the king, right? Mm-hmm. He's more focusing on the king as just like valuable as being a king, not necessarily as being like a CEO in the CEO structure, which is like more in keeping with the traditional reaction. Sure. Yarvin wasn't saying anything particularly original or new. And so Land was like, but the one nice thing that you were saying, or the one original thing you were saying, is that the king would be a CEO. And now you, you're acting like you don't even care about that. And it's like, well, they never really <laughs> cared. That was never the appeal. Right? Like, that was never another reason why the right is turning towards micro prison, fractal patchwork framework. They're turning towards that kind of hyper isolationist tendency. And they've always kind of been on that current. Not that isolationism ever truly happens, rather you just break down into wars forever. But, you know, the the social stability, if you were, the simplicity, the ease of control, one should say, of, of having super simple small communities, prisons, that tendency has been there long fucking before anyone said anything about fucking like CEOs and stock investors or whatever. So like, you know, once again, Lance a fucking idiot and <laughs> missed the whole dynamics that were going on around him. But yeah, so like, I think that whether or not it's called near reaction, and I honestly really doubt that that term will continue, whether it's called national anarchism also seems to be a meme kind of on, on the decline in many ways, although very influential in terms of the variety of different folks in, in the number of these spaces, whether that's called variety of different other things, hoppianism, whatever. I think that that kind of micro feudalistic fractal micro prisons approach negative freedom in the most perverse sense. I think that that's definitely emerging as the hegemonic position of conservatism and the action. And it will probably take different names. It will probably mutate. There will be like things where it regresses in some ways because they're like, oh, well, we can seize control of the U.S. state again because now that Tucker Carlson has become president, we have all the power to mass exterminate, blah, you know, et cetera, whatever they, whatever they end up doing, right? Like there will be ways in which they like jump forward opportunistically, the centralization and other things in other contexts. But I think that as a whole, the overall arc or the tendency is towards a kind of very pernicious negative freedom that ignores possibility. And well, the whole appeal of it is that it reduces possibility and makes things easier for more simple for minds that hate complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the only positive thing that I can see like coming from neo reactionary ideas being manifested is like the potential for like beheading a king. (laughs) So do you think there's a difference between neo reactionaries and Hoppians and Hoppian libertarianism? I mean, obviously, there's like a ton of surface level theoretical distinctions, cultural and social distinctions in terms of who their circles are. But, you know, as I said, like, I think it's all basically the same underlying dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. It's reaction is driven by a hostility to complexity. So it inevitably embraces a kind of ossified localist diversity where nothing touches anything else in any sort of liquid or complicating way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can see that in hoppianism around hostility towards complications in terms of title and property. So, you know, you look historically, what have humans actually found to be like useful in terms of property systems? They tend to be very complicated and context specific property systems. So title will get muddled up in complex ways. It won't like cleanly break. You can trade some aspects, but not other aspects. There's all sorts of different things that have started to play out. And then also times things don't play out that cleanly in terms of discretization, even for like legal sense in a contract, right? And all of those dynamics, they're not what the sort of people who get drawn to hoppianism like right they want the clean simplicity and there is something to be said for like you know if you orthogonalize property relations and trade and like a very strong or notions of title very strongly to enable trade cleanly do you get a lot of like knock off additional benefits and like fluidity and things along these lines you know you can fully disentangle yourself from an object that you created and you can trade that off to somebody else there's all there's all sorts of benefits to that i'm not i'm not saying that the a situation where we have infinitely complex, hyper particulars like property title dynamics is all that ideal either. My point, though, is that those things do emerge for real reasons, and they oftentimes have real utility, and people gravitate towards them for a variety of social reasons. You know, and we can talk about societies that don't have a state or don't have real state presence, right? And they oftentimes have much more complicated notions of property and they don't cleanly break apart. And Hoppians fucking hate that shit. They don't want that. And they also, broadly, the reason why clean heteropatriarchal lines, small atomic families, like all the things that Papa, like, you know, fucking, you know, goes off about and thinks that are like the, the pathway to like Western civilization, whatever, <laughs> like all that shit that he's on about, 
all those things are ultimately matters of simplification, right? Like he doesn't like the complexities that happens with like gender exploration and like, you know, different means of relating to one another, different modes of romanticism and the exploration of the vast space of possibilities, which you would think that like the whole fucking point of a market, sorry, like, you know, the whole fucking point of a market to a lot of us is that it opens up possibility and that it opens up the capacity for like invention and creation and finding new means of relating and like exploring the whole space of possibility. And the whole point, I think, for a lot of the people who are gravitated towards the hoppingism is that they want very simplistic sort of, they want the property relations that they grew up with. They want the mode of like the atomic, very hermetically sealed suburban middle-class bourgeois lifestyle, right? They want those kinds of things because they're so simplistic. And then they just make up really just completely ahistorically or off the cuff explanations or justifications to get them. And, you know, ultimately, something that is a lot simpler than trade is war. And that's the direction that all these kinds of like tendencies go towards, you know, nationalism is a lot fucking more simple than cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. War is more simple than the complexities of interpersonal relationships and like complex tapestries of trade and complex positive sum pro social like relations. Mm-hmm. War is dead fucking simple. And so like that's the pathway that all these people are on, right? Like they they may have like, you know, personal they may be like they may know the death toll in Iraq, right? They may go off and on and on about that. But the way that they ultimately end up conceptualizing it is like, you know, American soldiers were lost, American lives were lost, or like, you know, why should we get involved overseas? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care about your freedom, I care about mine, you know, et cetera. And the pathway of that kind of simplification, well, we can have some understanding and some sympathy for people who as kind of minds in retreat from the world, are inclined towards like fetishization of simplification. We can have some understanding for maybe the trauma and the like the Mm -hmm. variety of reasons that they've started off on that path. Ultimately though, like that path is really fucking clear cut. And there there, you know, like there's freedom and there's power. There's complexity or the bifurcating possibility of exploring ever more complex and fluid and (laughs) not reassuringly simple possibilities and systems. And then there's the reassuringly simple, you live in a suburban 1950s house, or you have like a trad wife, and then you like live in like this postcard of like a, you know, of a cottage in the Alps or whatever, like these images that people have are super simplistic, and they want to gravitate towards the thing where there are a limited number of variables for them. And we can understand it, have some level of sympathy for these people, but it is really, really dangerous. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some political tendencies that take like a patchwork light approach towards things. Panarchism is what I'm thinking of, actually. Do you think that panarchism ultimately suffers from similar issues? I mean, yes. Once upon a time, this was like totally a mean thing that you could never say aloud as an anarchist inside of certain spaces. But I feel like we were long past that point, And I feel also we've had enough of these conversations. I have seen some tortured definitions of panarchy that move towards something that you're like, okay, that could be less inherently pernicious, right? It can be more in line with like, or tolerable with like anarchist things. And of course, the creation of like a free society and the movement towards a free world is inherently going to be like all kinds of messy, right? Like people are going to have structures and associations and modes of relating towards one another that we don't like. We can't go in and be like, you need to be free in this like absolutely complexifying kind of way. So we're going to impose it upon you via like gulag. Obviously, that's not going to happen, right? Like people want to go off and like live in their fucking, you know, trad life communes or whatever fucking we have to let them, right? We also have to make sure that their children have access to the outside world and means of escape and etc and that there's you know some level of contact but you know there are trade-offs and there are tensions around that you know, obviously you can't store them in with guns and like shoot up people just because they have like a shitty cult right like there's all sorts of like tensions and dynamics that have to play out we are trapped in many ways in the pragmatism of the real world mm-hmm. but that does not mean that like we should see panarchy as a goal in and of itself or as having moral value for like its pluralism pluralism is meaningless in terms of moral value in and of itself, right? Like, there are good things and there are bad things. It's like people who will stretch diversity to mean all sorts of different things and be like, well, you know, if you really supported diversity, you would also support the diversity of there being abusers hurting their partners. And it's like, no. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. in, the, in the same way that people can stretch decentralization and mm-hmm. warp the term or like take it off in weird directions where it's like there should be no such thing as truth or there can be 
weird misrepresentations of the original reason that we gravitate towards a notion of diversity or pluralism or whatever along those lines. And there are definitely pluralisms that are fucking noxious and terrible. And a lot of examples and ways that I see panarchy is that it tends to be just like a quick exit from grappling with the complexities of actually trying to change the world and increase freedom. And while the actual pathway in the actual world, you know, the, the better futures that are slightly likely that we could come in contact with are likely to be very mixed, complex, muddied sort of like realities. I think that the tendency of panarchy is to throw your hands up and just be like, whatever will be, will be, hmm. right? And ignore that we have like a moral imperative to grapple with those, to struggle, to change those, you know, like the Paracon situation where like, okay, so you're trying to set up my entire region into like blah blah structures and endless meetings or whatever and i was like well i'll throw fucking molotovs at your meeting right like you know th there is a sense in which like our struggle is never done and anarchy is a direction not a location that we arrive at and so that direction continues to be a necessary push within like a panarchist world and i think that the term panarchy the very concept of it bundles in a kind of hands up disregard kind of like whatever will be will be pluralism that ignores the moral imperatives and the incentives to continue to grapple with things and in a variety of different ways and a variety of different levels and in contexts and all sorts of different specificities that we can't speak broadly of. And, you know, of course, the more, the more pernicious direction of panarchy is just like, well, yeah, they have a neo-Nazi regime over there, but you can't say anything about that. And you definitely shouldn't like try to launch an insurrection or like, you know, depose them. And that's completely fucking not true. Like, you know, we're going to smuggle guns to our friends and the neo-Nazi regime, we're going to like depose them, not only just because they're a threat to the people that they're ruling over, but because inherently that sort of like structure is a threat to everyone on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to punch Nazis. <laughs> like that's going to, that's going to happen regardless of whether or not that fits within some framework of like a pluralism. I'm not going to tolerate somebody who's working actively towards a genocide, right? I'm not going to be like, oh, well, but it would be preemptive action to try to, like, you know, stop them from recruiting an army to go implement their genocide. Like, I'm going to fucking do what is necessary. And there are moral complexities around that, but I think panarchy just, like, ignores them. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, an oversimplification, not embracing complexity yeah. in a way. That's interesting. All right. So to what extent would new municipalist or ostromite common resource management strategies for things such as water infrastructure be utilized in your ideal world? And are these arrangements compatible with individualism? Any plausible future is going to be like a mixed, messy, very complicated world of all sorts of trade-offs. And we're going to have to like try to path in a sometimes gradual, sometimes abrupt, but very not simplifiable in, in a single sweeping way has forward. But I think that like, I see Ostromite is more of a hyper individualist in, in a lot of ways, although not always. The Ostroms had like a vast panoply of different approaches and structures that they were categorizing, right? Their whole point was that there's a lot of diversity to the approaches and strategies that people take. Some of those approaches, I think, are highly criticizable by anarchists. They replicate centralization in different ways. They may not have like a state system by some of the same dangers and that kind of thing emerge. Municipalism, I think, you know, can trend in the direction of, you know, once again, going to a kind of a patchwork, discretized kind of system. I think that practically, however, there's some necessity to some of those systems. However, they are, especially given like certain technological forms. If you have magically overnight, everyone becomes anarchist and enlightened, but we're left with the infrastructure in the world that we have, there would still be issues with dealing with a centralization of like plumbing infrastructure right like a whole city uses the same plumbing system like what does that what does that amount to how do you like manage that and that kind of thing and i think like municipalist structures and the environment sites make a lot of sense in that in that context in some sense i tend to treat these structures these kinds of modes as the anarchist versions of the marxist transitory state so they're likely to emerge anyway kind of as simply as pragmatic conceptions or responses by the less enlightened in any given context. And we, of course, need to critically engage with them and think about alternatives. And I think there should be more space. And I would love to see more work done theorizing ways that certain approaches within those broader, broader categories of systems, certain ways in which specific systems can reinforce themselves and resist developments that might dissolve them or that can go off in pernicious directions. They would have like pernicious incentive structures built in that maybe weren't be fully re recognizable in, on, in certain dimensions, but would have knockoff effects in other aspects. And I would love to see more research, perhaps in, in the previously discussed development thread, 
of work where people might go into and break down and model, and analyze not only anarchist critiques, but alternatives within that framework so that if magically tomorrow everyone wakes up as an anarchist, not that that's going to happen, but some sort of social change happens where you get presented with options within those frameworks, we have a better understanding of what we're moving into. And again, the Austin system is so hyper particularized to given situations, uh, Austin system, there's no overarching system, but like the approaches and the insights that the Austrians had about those kinds of systems, they're so sweeping and so multifaceted. And so, there's so many different versions of them that we really should do more work. And I would love to see anarchist Ostromites plumb more deeply in more of a critical or a more of a forward thinking kind of direction within that space. And then, of course, when it comes to like municipalism, there's examples of, you know, obviously some degree of bookchinism and municipalism at play in Rojava, but. That is very like an abstract theoretical framework that hasn't really been explored. So I would love to see more work in that. And that includes praxis, hands-on sort of iteration of action and theory. Mm -hmm. So you've written extensively on anarchy and scale. And one of your more popular articles titled Anarchy is a Scale Independent Proposition, you wrote that small scale equals responsive and effective. But later on in the same article, you also said that with bigger scale comes bigger risk. One might be able to interpret these as having some tension there. Is the implication that the scale of authoritarian institutions such as governments pose unique threats that depend on their size? If so, what's more of a threat, a relatively small government or a larger one? So... Larger governments can leverage economies of scale and mobilize in big sweeping ways. They're also, in contrast, less finely responsive and effective in doing harm. So, you know, you'll see firebombing campaigns that kill hundreds of thousands of people or whatever, but will not be particularly good at actually stomping out a guerrilla movement or resistance movements because they're so clumsy in some ways. There's large scale atrocities that come there. But it's not all clear to me that we can evaluate whether small, tightly effective, tightly responsive governments are more of a threat than large, sweeping, clumsy governments in some sort of generic or a priori sense. And, you know, there's just so many particularities here that the categories are so broad and wide with so much diversity within them, both the category of like large scale and the category of small scale. I'm not sure that it's even feasible to speak of one being worse than the other. And I'm not sure also how we would set up a metric for that. A domestic abuser in many ways is just a government of one, right? And that abuser can do far more intimate and horrific harm to the single individual they target than a state is frequently capable of. In some sense, as you go up in scale, it's a bit like you are centralizing your bet. So like, let's say that there's a risk every time that you roll the dice, right? And the risk is the same. We might say the risk is the same. With negative consequences, the bet is, is stacked against you so that you're likely to lose and then how much you lose is like variable. Small scale government is kind of making the bet a whole bunch of different times with smaller sums. And large scale government is making the bet at one, putting everything, you know, all the chips in one pot and then rolling the dice once. Now, if the results are negative every fucking time <laughs> that you roll the dice, right, it's just a matter of how bad it is, then there is a sense in which, like, with the larger scale, the risk profile grows, right? Because, like, with the distribution of, there's going to be some averaging out that's going to happen, right? The, like, the, the more extreme atrocities that are going to happen inside of that society of, like, you know, a patchwork of many small governments, right? You're going to have very extreme genocides that are going to happen there. And you'll be like, well, at least those genocides weren't the entirety of the planet, right? But it's also the case that, like, with the larger scale government, maybe the likelihood that, like, the genocide across the entire planet isn't super certain either. So, you know, you could be like, well, if you roll the dice on the bigger government, then there's a lot of futures in which, like, there's no genocide, right? Because you have the bigger government and it's just, like, taxes and nanny states us into hell. But it doesn't, like, genocide us, like Rwanda or something, or neo Nazi right wing death squads or whatever. But you break things up into the smaller things, and it's almost certain that there's going to be a genocide, although that genocide will be smaller in scale, right? Like, how do you compare between those two things and say that one is better than the other? They have different risk profiles, they have distributions of harm in different ways. But if you were like thinking in terms of probability, 
in many ways, it's much the same. And I'm not saying that like I'm entirely wedded to this analysis. Like there may be some deeper analysis, something comes along at some point in the future that provides some sort of more particularized breakdown of all these different trade-offs and that kind of thing. And says that, oh, well, slightly speaking, but like, you know, like this one is slightly worse than the other. But I think the, th the important takeaway from this is that we oppose both, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> these, are, these are both fucking shit sandwiches. And while we need decentralization as a necessary condition, if not sufficient condition for anarchy, we really need to be aware that decentralization into retreat isolation, tiny little fiefdoms, tiny little prisons is not the same thing as decentralization and into a responsive, global, fluid, connective market, trade, community, collaboration, et cetera, that kind of thing. So towards the end of these interviews, I'd like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Okay. All right. Dunbar's number. Ah, uh, likely true to some extent with default homo sapiens, highly variable to some degree. The level to which humans are constrained depends upon the depth of understanding of the relationship, etc. Vastly pernicious in green anarchist circles in terms of uh, conceptual analysis and led a lot of green anarchists in the direction of microfascism and um, ecofascist takes. And watching them do that or go towards a direction where, like, for example, with the not specifically fascist per se, because they're not nationalist, but exterminationist, if not worse than fascism, group like individuals saying towards savagery, watching the people that got on board their camp and the arguments they made about like killing millions of people just because you don't know them, etc. Like watching that start to occur and build popularity in green anarchist circles was like the central thing that drove me away from those circles early on in the odds. Community. Um, you know, true anarchy will never be possible until uh, we defeat both the community and the ego. Wow. <laughs> that's a fucking, that's hard to fucking think about even. <laughs> um, I mean, like, obviously community in the sense of like a totalizing the community with capitalization or whatever is like this hugely pernicious influence. It oftentimes, the term community oftentimes gets leveraged uh, in really, really fucked up ways in anarchist circles and like in activist circles where people will say like, well, but, you know, we've got to, for the greater good of the community, or, like, you know, but, like, that person is a part of our community, and da 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 da, da and, like, you have to, like, have, you know, but, and, you know, like, one of the things that uh, people are prone to say is, like, well, not my community. Um, but I think, in that sense, like, community as a concept tends to be a discretization or a clustering, it tends to pull people in to say, like, this is a circle. And all of these people are a community. And uh, that's not a particularly network or fluid or anarchist way of looking at the world. I mean, it doesn't really understand. It extracts and simplifies away from the root human individual to individual relationships. All right. Last item on the list, accelerationism. Oh, God. Um, you know, I feel like there's good snark here. Maybe like you're not making pro-tech <laughs> perspectives any better. You're just making something more. Anyway, but. I mean, I don't know. Accelerationism, I don't tend to take very seriously. I think it tends to sit in a theory space or a community where what is fetishized is novelty and not necessarily like utility, practical capacity for change, or any real like conversation about value. There are interesting things that are done in accelerationist spaces, but they tend to have been done long ago in like, you know, just activist anarcho transhumanists who were talking among each other. So I don't tend to find a lot of value in all the things that get clustered together as like accelerationist. But, you know, I read everything. So I read a ton of that shit, too. I have a variety of thoughts and things that would go on on particulars far longer than a lightning round one minute would allow. So we'll let it up there. And uh, there's a there's a because of the lack of uh, attention to values, there is a, a huge degree of like fascist or like fucked up unethical creep that happens in, in those takes or in those spaces. Um, not all, but, uh, but many. And, and that's one of the reasons why I don't have much talk with them. All right. So we have time for one listener question, and then we will go to the end where you list your Twitter account and all that. Okay. A listener question we ask everyone, basically, is how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Oh, God. I mean, like, I don't have a utopia. So the, I don't know that the question like applies, right? There's a variety of different worlds that I think would be more liberatory than the world that we have right now. But whether that's like, 
the nanobot machines that are meshed in with my like digital implants automatically generate a cappuccino and build it like a Star Trek replicator for me, or whether that's like, you know, uh, I, I, I go to the fucking food cart on the fucking corner and I buy it, right? <laughs> All right. So where should folks go to follow you and your work? Well, I tend to publish first at C4SS. So at C4SS, you can go down on the footer and see the William Gillis section, and then there's just a ton of articles by me. And those involve more like current events responses and that kind of thing, and less abstract theoretical kind of pieces as well. And then at some point, most of those articles get republished. The more abstract ones get republished on humaniterations.net. Human iterations with an S. I think you said it in the intro. And yeah, so I post a lot of things there, including some things that I don't really necessarily think will fit on CFRSS. So things that are more like personal rambles or like feminist analysis or like a variety of different things that are more like um, interpersonal or that kind of or psychological or that kind of thing, as well as like just geek shit, you know, I'll write something about a science fiction movie or something. And then, of course, I have a Twitter, which is at Rechelon. That's the letter R and the word echelon. So R-E-C-H-E-L-O-N. Probably folks already know about that. I have a unfortunate Twitter addiction. And so some, some high level of presence. But yeah. And did you have a Patreon you wanted to plug? Oh, I mean, I have one and you can find it on my via my human iterations account. But I'm pretty well off financially right now these days. So I don't encourage people to post that. If people are interested in donating, there are a variety of info shops in the Global South and other anarchist projects in the Global South that I think that people should donate to. There is a project that at some point when I finally get some breathing room, we're going to put online that tries to provide an index for ways to donate to those projects in the Global South. If you search on Patreon for InfoShop, I think that there are uh, a few info shops available that you can provide donations to. I think providing in-space infrastructure and meeting opportunities for people is really critical, and I think that it's really important to building out social movements. So I would encourage people to donate to anarchist projects, and particularly anarchist physical in-space community space building projects. And I also think that your dollar goes far further if you donate to those projects in the global south. I do, and I encourage other people to do as well. All right. Cool, Will. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you coming on. I didn't get to ask you as many questions as I wanted, but I thought this went really well. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure talking with you. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviamedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviamedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.